interesting. Um, welcome everyone. We're very happy today to have uh, Becky Schwartz speaking to us about the tale of three cities, Philly, DC, and Boston. Becky is the Senior Manager of Urban Forestry at American Forest, where she runs the Tree Equity Tree Planting Program. In her previous roles, she managed the Community Tree Planting Program at Casey Trees, where she planted with volunteers and communities across Washington, DC. She also worked in various federal, municipal, and nonprofit roles, most recently as a DC city forester. In her free time, she enjoys playing taiko Japanese drums and giving impromptu tree tours to her wife and dog. So Becky, if you would like to share your screen, um, I'm sure we're all very excited to hear your comparisons about these different cities. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I'm excited to be here. A uh, long time lurker, first time presenter. <laughs> um, let me get this going. There we go. All right. Uh, welcome again. My name is Becky Schwartz. I currently work at American Forests and I run their tree equity tree planting program. Uh, today I'm actually going to be talking about three different cities. Uh, these are cities I have lived and worked in across the Northeast. That is uh, Philly, DC, and Boston. Um, I'm just going to be giving a quick overview of all these cities, and then I will open the floor to some discussion as well. Um, and I just want to put a plug for this lovely picture that I took in October. <laughs> this is none of those cities, unfortunately. This is Cambridge, where I currently live. Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is just north of Boston. Um, and this is just some lovely fall color showing on Halloween last year and the nice rainbow over the Charles River and into the Cambridge side of the Charles. All right, just a little bit about me. I know Kinsey mentioned some stuff. Um, I don't have a traditional forestry background. My background is in sustainability and environmental justice. So I studied sustainability at Arizona State and then I panicked and decided to get a master's degree. And I went to the University of Michigan. Um, my degree says natural resources and environment, but I really studied environmental justice. Um, more focused on the research side and then also the studying pollution and what can be done about pollution. I have a variety of work that I've done uh, only in the public sector. I've worked for the Forest Service uh, in Philadelphia, the US Forest Service Philadelphia Field Station. I've worked in nonprofits. Uh, I've worked at Casey Trees, as Kinsey mentioned, working with uh, volunteers and communities across the district to plant. And I currently work at a nationwide focused nonprofit called American Forests, which is also based in DC, although I live in Cambridge. And I've worked for the municipal government. I worked uh, for the Tree Philly program, working directly with the street tree program there um, and the streets department, um, tree tree department. And then also as a city forester, that was my most recent position before American Forests. Um, I worked specifically in Georgetown, Colorado and Berleith, which are the wealthiest, widest areas of DC. Um, I like to say that I was the arborist for the Obamas and the Kushners because they lived like a couple blocks from each other. So the goal of this presentation is to give you an overview of the cities that I've worked in before, what they were doing well, the challenges that they faced, and suggestions for improvement. So again, I'm going to try to go back in time a little bit and kind of give you a snapshot of where I was, what I was thinking at the time, so some of the stuff isn't going to be quite, quite current. Um, I want to give a plug for the photo on the right. This is something I took at the Arnold Arboretum, um, which is owned by Harvard University, totally free in Boston, if you ever get to come. Um, beautiful, beautiful tree, one of the highlights of their collection. Um, I don't remember what the tree was, but I'll put it in the chat here. Just some caveats about this presentation. Again, this is speaking from my personal experience, my thoughts, opinions. They're not those of my current and former employers. And some of this information is going to be old. Things have changed, people have changed, funding has changed, programmatic goals have changed. So just wanted to let you guys know that too. So before we go back in time, I would like to give you all a quick snapshot of what these three cities are, um, their population, the square mileage, and then an estimate of how many trees are in these cities. 
Philadelphia is the largest city population wise and also square mileage wise and also tree wise. Again, some of this information is a little old um, from forest service studies and such. And then DC is a little smaller. Again, this is estimated population. I wasn't able to get 2020 census data. So it's likely higher than what I've listed. Um, it has the smallest, smallest square mileage of all the three cities, but still a very large chunk of trees there. And then Boston has a similar population to DC. Again, I'm expecting it to be higher in the 2020 census. It's got more square mileage than DC. And I estimated the number of trees. That's like a super rough estimate, which is probably incorrect. Um, I was looking for an estimate, but if you have one or know of one, just feel free to put it in the chat. Feel free to correct me there. Continuing that idea of an overview, I wanted to give uh, a quick take on what the tree canopy looks like in each city. Just to note that I'm not going to be comparing these maps because this is all different types of data, so that would be unfair for me to do that. But I just want you to have a quick idea of where are the areas of highest canopy in these cities and where are the areas of lowest canopy in these cities. And again, all this information is publicly available too if you want to take a look later on. All right, so now we're going to get in our time machine. I have picked a TARDIS, but I hope you have picked something, um, maybe a DeLorean. And we're going to go back in time 10 years and get ready. I'm not going to play the Doctor Who song, but I'm hoping you can think about the theme song in your head. While we go to Philly, all right, it's been 10 years. We're going to go back in time. Now it's 2012. Welcome. Uh, I want to give you an urban forestry overview of Philly 10 years ago. So biggest takeaway is that at that time, Philly was losing more trees than it was replanting. That was just the big reality there. So I'm just gonna kind of let that pause and seep in a little bit. I do wanna point out many things that different organizations in that time period were doing well. So the organizations that I mostly worked with as the second tree, the honorary second tree Philly intern <laughs> of that program, um, I believe that program had started about six months to a year before I uh, was an intern there. I worked also as an intern at the Forest Service Philadelphia Field Station and worked very closely with the Tree Tenders Program at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. So keeping those things in mind, all those different organizations did community outreach and engagement super well. So for example, the Tree Tenders Program, we have some Tree Tenders folks here on this call. Um, the way that program works is they have specific tree tender groups for different neighborhoods across Philly. And these are run by volunteers and neighbors and residents of those communities that have lived there long-term and worked there long-term. So that's excellent. Another example of this is the Tree Philly program, building an intentional tree equity program from the ground up. Um, very environmental justice focused from the beginning. I know that Erica and other team members of mine at the time were looking directly at um, urban heat island maps, environmental justice maps, tree canopy maps, things like that, trying to figure out where trees were and where trees weren't and why, and directly figuring out how to create a program to address that. And then I think, as you know, Tree Philly is very well known for marketing. So the um, pictures I have on the right hand of these slides are the marketing program that first came out when I first got there as an intern. Um, this was pro bono work by Masterminds, uh, agency, which their link is at the bottom right hand corner. They approached Tree Philly. I don't remember all the details. Said, hey, we want to help you. And Tree Philly's like, sure. Uh, and then these beautiful posters came out of that partnership. These are seasonal posters. So they're based on the seasons, but they're also super de duper based in uh, important Philly landmarks and then trees. I thought it looked really cool. Everybody loved it. I remember when they first showed the posters and I was like, oh, this is so exciting. So the really cool thing about this type of marketing, I think it was Tree Philly's like first big marketing campaign was it was like very multi-purpose. So you can use these on websites, you can make print materials, big and small. So for example, um, the Tree Philly program like blew this up into a huge poster and gave it to the mayor at the time and the mayor really liked it. 
So now moving into some of the challenges, uh, some of the big challenges I noticed as an intern was communication and collaboration. So for example, with different city agencies, um, there would be some conflicts that would arise. Uh, one example is that one time Erica and I went to talk to um, one of the permitting agencies in the city. Um, unfortunately, in parts of Philadelphia, maybe the sidewalk is too narrow or the tree box is too small, but residents still really wanted to plant something there. And so they would have like pots of all sizes with really cool plants. And so I went to the permitting agency and said, hey, like, isn't this beautiful? What do you think about pots? Can we have pots in the public space? And the answer was no, no pots. Nobody can have pots. <laughs> um, we're like, okay. And so as we're like walking outside the agency, we're going to another meeting. Guess what we see? Pots, pots of plants on the sidewalk. Oh no. So example of that. And of course, collaboration between partner nonprofit organizations. So tree tenders work very closely with the city street tree department to get permissions for their tree plantings, which are about, I think, a thousand at the time, a thousand in the spring and a thousand in the fall. So they give a list to the city, say, hey, we want to plant these trees. And the city would say, okay. And the city foresters would have to go check as they're planting work orders there, what's going on. So that process still needed a lot to work out because both parties were unhappy um, with that at the time. And then for the public, uh, public really likes trees. They give a call to the street tree department or 311 and say, hey, can I get a new tree? Can I get a tree pruned? And so the communication there was typically like, oh, it's gonna be two to three years. It's a long time, so sorry, you're on the list. And so that uh, unfortunately didn't breed the best trust in the public um, with that agency. At the time I was an intern there, there were seven city foresters for the entire city of Philadelphia. That felt very small. That definitely did not feel like enough staff. Um, so that kind of begets funding and staffing. Again, when I started there, the city tree tree department was just starting a data journey into better data management collection in terms of tree inventory as well as work orders. So um, that was just starting because at the time there wasn't really good data on that and good management of that. So some suggestions for improvement. Again, this is just from my own perspective. Um, at the time, the city had an opt-in out opt-out system. So if you didn't want a tree, totally fine, just opt out. So what the city would do is they'd send mailers to um, residents where trees would be planted. If the resident didn't want a tree, they would just send the mailer back saying, hey, don't want it, take it off the list. But there were some misconnections there. And so the contractor would come out. For example, sometimes there were blocks where there are multiple tree planting opportunities and residents would come out and say, hey, I didn't get a mailer, what's going on? And then unfortunately only a few of those trees could be planted. So my suggestion for improvement is just forget, change the name of that, maybe find a marketing team that can help you find a new name. If it is city property, um, which I believe it is, but anyone can feel free to correct me. Um, if the tree box is city property and city jurisdiction, take that back under the city. You may not, have, you may not be able to plant 10,000 trees, but the trees that you plant specifically make sure that they're maintained. Um, such that the resident doesn't have to worry about it, but you take ownership as a city of that as a suggestion. And then in terms of policy, like I mentioned with the pots, there's inconsistencies in enforcement. It's just the nature of a city. So just having more consistent rules and understanding and collaboration between agencies is very helpful. And then at the time in Philadelphia, if a street tree or a private property tree broke up your sidewalk or broke up your alleyway, the residents had to pay for that repair. And so that caused a lot of distrust. People didn't wanna to pay to have things repaired again and again and again. And so they opted out of trees. And so just having a new methodology in terms of repair and creating sidewalks, alleys and systems that can um, work with tree roots um, would be much more beneficial to trees holistically and, and people's perceptions of maintenance and ability to maintain without them having to pay lots and lots of money to pay for the repair and the permit process. All right, so now we're gonna to move to DC. I was in DC the longest of these cities. Um, 
But my big takeaway here is uh, death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> so uh, when I was in DC, I worked for two different organizations. The first, uh, as you can see on the right, I worked for Casey Trees, which is a big tree planting and education nonprofit. And then I worked as a city forester. Um, the city forestry agency is called the Urban Forestry Division. It's located in the District Department of Transportation. But I felt at the time it was death by a thousand cuts because there's so much change going on all the time. Private property is being developed, public property is being developed, federal property is changing. <laughs> um, and then you also have dynamics within the public realm. Schools are being built, roads are being repaired, sidewalks are being updated. All those things are very hard to control, even if you're trying to do it one at a time. Some things I want to point out that are done well. I'm just going to put this under the bucket uh, from my perspective of long-term vision. So one thing DC does very well is they reach all types of properties, not just public property, all types of properties. That can be through funding mechanisms, that can be through policy, that could be through partnerships. They also touch the tree at all stages of its life. That's very important. It's not just tree planting, it's not just mature trees. The policy, the practice, the collaboration tries to touch trees at all stages of their lives. The DC uh, Urban Forestry Division has very ambitious goals. They have very ambitious tree planting goals. 8,000 trees a year, I believe the last five to 10-ish years. They've been doing that. Again, that's just my estimate. That is not quite factual data. Um, but they not only said we're going to have a big ambitious tree planting goal, actually they did it. I did it, we did it. So that was that was very special. They have a lot of funding. Again, that is not the result of now. That was built up over 10, 15 years of advocacy by multiple people, multiple parties and organizations. So again, very blessed that way. And that begets great expertise and not just expertise only in one organization, luckily spread out through all types of organizations as well to help. But that being said, there's still challenges. Um, photo on the right is my street tree, uh, my fellow um, urban foresters and my team at the time. Um, I mentioned this a little bit with Philly. There's still a lack of collaboration. So for example, we're in the District Department of Transportation. That same agency repairs sidewalks. Sometimes the sidewalk team would notify urban foresters, say, hey, we got a project, can you help us? A lot of times I wouldn't know until a tree started looking unhealthy or somebody called me. So again, continued collaboration is really important. And then also for local nonprofits. So the city had a very ambitious tree planting goal and so did some other local nonprofits as well. And sometimes that wasn't always the most collaborative process. In terms of my suggestions for improvement, I, I would suggest putting environmental justice and tree equity front and center. So for example, there's some organizations that would have planting locations and they would come back to the same uh, location year after year after year. Very easy to do, right? Maybe not the most environmentally just thing to do. Um, in terms of practitioners, so the Urban Forestry Division worked with contractors and sometimes those contractors would hire folks that had barriers to uh, employment, which is great, very exciting for me as again, personally. Um, and then that would be great. We get to work with them, we get to know them. However, there was no pipeline for them to get training, become foremen, have better jobs, have better pay, maybe even be, take my job one day, right? Um, that wasn't quite there yet, but that can absolutely be created. Many organizations, there are many free resources, things of that nature to get that started. And then of course, policy. So DC has one of um, a really strong tree policy. That being said, there's still many ways to get around that policy. So just improving ways to not get around that policy, but also creating a culture of trust through developers and other people that work with that policy all the time. So they don't go around that policy. It's not just necessarily a monetary fund. All right, so now we're moving to Boston, um, an organization, uh, a, a city that I am very new to. I've only lived in Cambridge and worked in the area for about eight months. 
Um, I took this selfie on a, uh, a site visit with our, our partners um, at Speak for the Trees Boston, um, which is very exciting. So again, just knowing that I don't have as much experience there as other cities, my urban forestry overview in today's time is that they're behind their East Coast peers for many reasons. Um, disinvestment is one of the major reasons that that's happened, but they have a lower tree canopy percentage than a lot of their East, other East Coast cities. However, organizations like Speak for the Trees, local nonprofits, uh, community groups are doing really well to build coalitions. I thought that was really interesting. There's some organizations that that comes later in their organizational path, but this was a really first one. Um, I thought that was really, really great. Also, studying and learning what other organizations do in tree planting and climate justice and racial uh, justice as well. And not just before, for example, Speak for the Trees was created, lots of research was done about that, but that's currently still happening. That learning, that growing, I think that's really important. I know there's some organizations that just like are like, we know it, we're done learning. Um, and then Speak for the Trees specifically and other organizations that they collaborate with, collaborate with very clear environmental justice focus. People on the Speak for the Trees board, organizations that they collaborate with, partners, things of that nature, they make their environmental justice focus very loud and clear. They're not hiding it at all. And some of the major challenges. Um, there is only one city forester in Massachusetts. It's called a tree warden for the entire city of Boston. Just gonna put that out there. At the time I worked in Philly, there were seven city foresters. That was 2014. And at the time when I worked for the Urban Forestry Division in DC, there were 24. That has a lot to do with disinvestment. Disinvestment is not unique to Boston. Many cities experienced this where a lot of tax, the tax base had left. And so the city had to make very challenging decisions in terms of budgets. So room for improvement. The first one, of course, is funding. Uh, luckily, as in many cities in the US, funding is coming back. Businesses are coming back. Tax base is coming back. That really, really helps the situation. So there's more funding and support for city agencies, nonprofit agencies for urban forestry. A lot of trust has been lost, um, not just in Boston, but in all the cities because of the disinvestment. So just continuing to build that trust with communities, with organizations, with other partners on the ground is really, really important. And then taking lots and lots of big actions. So not just small actions, one tree planting here, one tree giveaway here, things like that, building momentum through partnerships, through funding, through all these things to take really big actions, really long-term actions. That really helps get attention on the campaign, on urban forestry, pardon me, and builds, builds your credentials and trust. That's it. I know my presentation was pretty short, um, but I did want to suggest some questions for reflection, discussion. Um, if you are currently working in the city, or you've had worked in these cities, I'm curious to know what's changed in that 10 year time frame and what are your suggestions for improvement. I'm also happy to answer your questions in general too, if you want to take the conversation in that direction. Um, and if you want to continue the conversation at any point outside of this, I left my personal email um, and we can connect that way. So thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. That was a wonderful overview. Um, as someone who has, I've worked in Philadelphia and now I've worked in Pittsburgh. I've seen a little bit of some of what you're talking about, about disinvestment and those kinds of things. So it's interesting to hear how that extends across different cities. And I know that uh, right now with American Forest, you have the opportunity to go and do tree plantings in numerous different places. And I wonder um, what sorts of surface level uh, comparisons you may have seen across some of those cities as well as Philly, Boston and DC. Um, I would say there's still, um, similar echoes of not great collaboration between and within city agencies or between nonprofits and city agencies. There are definitely sometimes where that's worked out well and sometimes where that is still 
uh, clunky, a clunky process. Um, also the process of disinvestment and trying to work with all kinds of agencies and organizations in big round tables or collaborative efforts to get investment back into urban forestry and whatever point that city is at. Some are at a point where they have a master plan or they're implementing stuff and some are at a point where they just need any help. So it's that's been interesting to see. The other thing that's been interesting too is that there are many, many ways to do this. So some cities really work collaboratively with volunteer bases and partnership organizations. Some cities work very directly with contractors and some cities work only with city staff. So for example, with Phoenix, I was in Phoenix this past weekend doing a huge tree planting and tree equity kickoff with American Forest, the city of Phoenix, many other partners. And the city of Phoenix prided themselves on having all their city forestry staff, like 20, 25 very well-trained people out helping to plant, bringing the dirt, like bringing the water trucks. Like it was a beautiful like symphony of things moving around safely. I was very happy. <laughs> um, in other cities I've worked in, that would be a, oh, only contractors do that, you know, kind of thing. So that is totally fine. I think there are many systems and just sharing that information with other people in a collaborative way is really helpful because there are definitely some times where, and sometimes as a city forester too, I've been busy and I've been like doing my work. Thank you. Um, we have a request for you to post your email address, maybe in the chat, if that's all right. Sure, yep. Sophie, go ahead and unmute. Great, thanks. Um, Becky, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Sophie. I work in New York City and um, here in New York during the Million Trees NYC campaign, we actually ended the um, ability for residents to decline a tree being planted in the public right of way in front of their house. And I was just interested in sort of the reflections you brought up um, in Philly, how that was happening. And I was wondering, sort of based on your work in, in equity, what what implications does the ability to decline a tree have on tree equity? Um, if you have canopy goals that you're trying to reach, but you're also trying to like engage the community and, and honor their needs. Um, and were there different policies in um, DC and Boston on declining trees and what implications that had? So I'm not as familiar with Boston. So if somebody is, feel free to, to jump in. <laughs> Um, I don't quite know what their policy is in terms of, I think it's opt out, but I don't know how they communicate that. Um, they being the city or other organizations that support that. In DC, um, I'm only familiar with the system I had at the time. So I, again, don't know past history that has changed. So as a city forester, it was very clear to us where the jurisdiction lines were. We could also look it up on a map, very helpful. Um, and we basically just said, this is our property. We had lots of communication. We have online pamphlets. I can happily share that with you. Um, we also have print pamphlets. We'd leave it and say, hey, you're getting a tree. If you have any questions, let me know. We would come as a city forester on planting day with the contractors as well, right? The contractors wouldn't just go out by themselves. We would come. And if we needed to talk to somebody, we would. And if they complained, that's fine. I would give them my card. I'd give them pamphlets, say, hey, totally fine. Feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to your city council member, whoever. However, this is our jurisdiction. And because it's a city jurisdiction, we want to reach our tree canopy goals. And we will take care of this tree, I promise you. You'll see our contractors, the same contractors that are coming back to plant, um, will water the tree. So having outreach and doing outreach that way was really helpful and beneficial. Having outlets for people to talk to people, that's what I could do. But I, as a city forester, couldn't quite do like what you said in terms of like all the outreach and education in different languages and things like that to really say like we have this here's our plan if you want to help with maintenance that's great but luckily we can we we have the ability to do that awesome thanks becky had trouble unmuting myself there um yasha <laughs> i see your hand is raised do you want to go ahead and ask your question Sure, thanks. Yeah, um, I, I don't know how to unraise my hand, but I'll figure it out afterwards. Um, 
Yeah, just to comment that um, I think that this exact question that Sophie raised is uh, gets to the heart of um, what I see as a tension between distributive justice and uh, procedural justice um, that I think, you know, I don't have a firm answer on, but um, I think is an important um, question for urban foresters to, to wrestle with, um, which is like, if you're trying to uh, resolve distributional inequities in urban tree canopy, for instance, um, does that trump uh, questions of procedural justice or um, or not? Or I, I know I know there are lots of urban foresters who say find a third way, which involves uh, involving community uh, members in the decision making process and also solving the distributional inequity. But um, I do think there's cases where that tension exists for a lot of us urban foresters. So I would love for someone to like write an article exploring that topic somewhere. Um, actually, uh, along with some of my colleagues at the Urban Field Station in New York City, we are publishing an article on just that topic. Um, so <laughs> it's in press right now. Um, and we do, it's, it's very theoretical, but we do sort of talk about sort of structures of justice and like distributional justice <laughs> at, through the lens of urban forestry and urban greening. Uh, so I will share that with this group uh, awesome. via email when it's published. Thanks, Sophie. That's great to hear. Um, we have a question from Marcus Ferreira. Uh, one of the limiting rules in Philly is the no tree in front of a doorway rule, uh, which is tough when there are doorways every 16 to 18 feet in residential neighborhoods. Do DC and Boston have similar rules to that? Um, Again, I'm not as familiar with Boston. I will say that Boston can get around this a little bit for now because luckily they have a lot of opportunity for tree planting. So I think they'll probably put that one aside for now. Um, in terms of DC, yes, we had specific public space rules, which again are publicly available. I'm happy to share if you send me an email. Um, yeah, you weren't allowed to put a tree box in front of a door. That being said, in typical city fashion, there were tree boxes in front of doors. <laughs> because that's just the infrastructure. Sometimes you inherit infrastructure that's changed or things change. And I don't have a history of that. So yes, there's sometimes when me as a city forester, I wouldn't use that specific spot because of what you said, or I would try to scoot the tree over to the corner um, to make sure that there was a pathway for the person as much as I could. Um, I will say that DC has different infrastructure than Philly too. So it's not always a fair comparison. There are definitely parts of the district where exactly you have very narrow sidewalks or no sidewalk. The front door just enters the alleyway or something like that. Yeah, unfortunately, you couldn't put a tree there. Um, but there are definitely parts of DC that have been completely restructured and redone to have that opportunity for trees or bigger tree boxes or revisiting parks, schools, rec centers, things of that nature too. Um, one thing that I felt very fortunate that we were able to do as a city was to expand tree boxes and make them bigger um, and make them more of a continuous line rather than just box, 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 box. Um, and also continue to work with developers if there was a restriction to have structural soil or other components that the roots could live under the sidewalk in a small and narrow space. I know that not everybody has that opportunity to. Thanks, Becky. Uh, Danielle piped in in the chat uh, from New York that NYC's planting guidelines also include not planting in front of doorways. That seems to be a rule that is across the board in some cities. Yasha had also asked in the chat if anyone had developed and published something like an urban forest management best management practices that was focused on these questions of administration, coordination, contracts versus internal staffing and stocking. Etc. cetera, um, and Laura responded that Amber Grant is soon publishing a paper about environmental justice and urban forest plans that emphasizes that distributional justice is usually all that's mentioned with hardly any other aspects of justice. Um, so if anyone has any knowledge about a best management practices paper, uh, feel free to pipe in in the chat or uh, out here, <laughs> uh, whatever you're comfortable with.
I also had a question um, thinking, coming from the tree care industry side of things, uh, a lot of these discussions focus on what is possible in um, municipal uh, like capacities of, as far as city foresters, municipal foresters, and that kind of thing. How do you see the tr private tree care industry as a whole being looped in? Because that's something I've seen in terms of uh, uh, gaps in service between who is able to take care of street trees um, and like what is affordable for residents. And I think that is an interesting opportunity for a bridge between some of these conversations that are happening in urban forestry and municipal spaces and uh, more private tree care spaces. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's something that I think I, I agree that it requires a lot of improvement. Um, so at American Forest, we definitely work, not me, but our career pathways program, um, which works with um, individuals that have barriers to employment. And also part of that program is trying to encourage those, those individuals to start businesses. So maybe there's an opportunity there. And there's also an opportunity through connections to get those individuals into um, good paying private tree care company roles. So I think just taking that and knowing that I have connections, Kinsey has connections, other or people on this call have connections and starting those conversations. I, as an individual, was able to do things, but that was like on a really tiny case by case basis. I worked with a, um, a cemetery in DC that had ficus, uh, that had a lot of disinvestment. And I talked to one of our tree care contractors and said, hey, Unfortunately, this organization has no money. They have some high hazard trees. Would you, could you do some pruning for them? And they said, yes. Um, and so that, again, that was like on an individual basis, but I think those things can happen in small doses, especially if um, the private tree care company is able to get like a tax break, they're able to get notoriety or media on that and say, hey, like we're not just an organization that does tree care work. We really care about the community too. Um, and then also just bringing them into policy discussions too, I think is important. Something we haven't really touched upon because when you implement a tree policy, that means that a lot of stuff is going to go to private industry. So tree care management plans, people putting in the tree permit, things like that. And you're gonna have to work directly with those organizations so having conversations with them when you're implementing policy and not just them, but also the people that are going to be implementing the policy too, which I know doesn't always happen, um, can be beneficial because hopefully that creates more of a disincentive for them to get around the regulation too. Great, thanks Becky. Do we have any other questions or discussion topics hanging out uh, in, the, in the group that would like to see some airtime? We have some interesting conversation happening in the chat about uh, different availability of different articles. So if you're interested in looking at uh, some of some articles about the things that we've been talking about, I would recommend uh, checking out some of these chat links. There was also a question about um, reasons that what reasons are people giving for not wanting trees? Becky, do you have any insight in that? Um, I think it's similar reasons to what was posted in the chat. And I was actually talking with uh, Laura about this the other day, Laura Roman, who's on the call, hey, Laura. Um, so uh, mentioning basically that um, there's distrust. So residents and other neighbors have seen that trees have been planted and not cared for in the past. And I don't mean like the last five years. I mean, the last 20 to 50 years. Again, not always fair to that individual because I haven't been alive as long, but um, that is okay. It's also difficult because you've inherited a lot of these things and you can't go back in time and be like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so a lot of the times it was disinvestment, distrust and just trying to get on the ground and talk to those people 
and try to build as much as you could. It's not a perfect system. Um, there are definitely ways to do it. And Yasha mentioned that things of that nature where you have people from that group that speak their language and culture and show up and show up to you know what is doing and that actual, even if it's on a really small scale, like people from your community really care and are doing something about it is a really powerful message. Um, much more powerful than sometimes me showing up as that's totally fine. Um, and so speaking to that is in those kinds of languages and touchstones is really helpful. Uh, it's not always a really beautiful and exciting process because it takes a lot of time and money and effort. Um, and know that that maybe isn't reasonable for certain organizations or people, people to do. Um, and, but that can hopefully lead to more in, in excitement and engagement, but it's a long-term process. So you can maybe help like a little bit here and there, but it would take five to 10 years of people seeing all those things to really be like, okay, I see that whoever organization has my back now, they're really caring for the trees with people I know or I care about. Uh, they're watering the tree. I see them pruning the tree. I see somebody supervising that pruning that I can talk to. Things, things like that really help build that, but it's a similar reason. You know, I don't want my sidewalk broken up because I can't pay for it. I have seen years where I watched all the trees get cut down and now you're replanting them. I can't fix my house. I can't, you know, do those things. I have many other worries or barriers. So those are some really small ways to break that down, but it will definitely take like a longer time to hopefully get um, that back on track. This also brings to mind for me, Dr. Christine Carmichael's work in Detroit. She has um, papers about why folks in Detroit were rejecting trees as well as environmental justice in that city that I would recommend looking into if you are curious. Laura says, stay tuned for an article on why people don't want trees in North Philly. Um, she'll share it with the UEC when it comes out. Fear of future financial burdens and infrastructure conflicts is a major issue and lack of trust due to past disinvestments. Um, basically people liked trees and green spaces but did not feel supported in having trees. And the Philly tree plan that's coming out is putting forth a lot of recommendations to address this, which definitely looking forward to seeing that. I know that it's been, uh, uh, it, it's been in works in the works for several years now. So the Philly tree plan will be exciting to see. And Erica, I see that you're on the call. If you have anything to plug in about that, I uh, would love to hear any updates. You're muted. I'm, I meant to unmute myself and not show you my, me <laughs> instead. So that, that's fun. We're recording this, yay. <clears throat> um, so the Philly tree plan is, is in its final editing uh, phase and it's really um, very, very close <laughs> to coming out. Um, we just need to get final, uh, final eyes on it from our steering committees and, um, and our project team, several of whom are actually on this call. So uh, stay tuned. We hope it will come out next month. Thanks, Erica. Very excited to see that. And lots of, sorry, I, I'm so embarrassed that I turned on my video and not my, my microphone and you all saw me taking a rest in my house. That is all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we're actually, there's so much about uh, the things that, that Becky mentioned that we are tackling in the tree plan. Um, ways to reduce the burdens on people, um, ways to take responsibility and make responsibility more, more clear um, in the city. Um, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we've identified uh, that's very similar to what Becky identified <laughs> that needs to change and needs to be, um, needs to be improved. So I appreciate um, the, the insight. It's very, it's very um, affirming to see, uh, you know, that some of the things that Becky, you've noticed are things that we've identified for the plan. 
and I'm excited for everyone to see it too. <laughs> yeah, once that comes out, please uh, send a link to the UEC. I'm sure that many of us would be interested in, in reading it. Yeah, um, I absolutely will. And Pete, to, Pete, to your question, um, one of the things that's holding up the plan from being released is that we are doing uh, lots and lots of work getting internal departmental okays on everything. And so um, the communication and coordination and, and things even like policy change and things like that, we are getting everyone on board who needs to be on board before we release it so that the plan that is released, um, all of those things are ready to be implemented when whenever we can line everything up. So, so yeah, we're, we're trying to do all of that background work before the plan comes out so that we can just start running with it once it's out. Awesome, thanks so much for the update. Mm -hmm. um, Erica, if you wanna to speak to this or maybe some other folks too, uh, I'm curious to hear like some of the positives of like what has changed. It can be Philly, wherever you are. Um, I mean, from the perspective of Philly, I think that, you know, our marketing did a lot to get us attention and funding, um, but we've kind of leveraged that and used that to be able to, to focus even more on the environmental justice aspects of what we do. And some of my teammates are here who might have something to say about that if I <laughs> put them on, uh, put, put them, identify them, or if they want to identify themselves. We actually have on this call right now, we have like four current and past Tree Philly team members. <laughs> Kinsey, 2017, Becky, 2013. We've got Kate, current. And I think that's Jack on Jack's iPad. It could be someone else. Oh, Kate's on the bus, so can't can't talk. Anyway, uh, and, and Marcus is on our, our community voices steering committee for the Philly Tree Plan, and Laura's on the project team for the, the Philly Tree Plan. So lots of great, great folks. And John is uh, our natural lands, one of our natural lands team members at Parks and Rec. So John and Sophie, you guys should talk to each other. I also see Julia, I think, on this call, who um, I worked with uh, at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and the Urban Forestry Branch there as well. So we've got big rep in from uh, Philly today, which is really exciting. Um, I did want to say, I, I think I can speak a little bit to some of the collaborative work that's happening in Pittsburgh, um, specifically between nonprofit and municipal. I know that. Uh, Tree Pittsburgh has a very close relationship with the city forester and gets assistance um, with the machinery and things like that um, at different times for tree plantings. So that's a good collaboration that happens. Um, and it, it's nice to see a, a fair amount of communication between those two different parties. I'm not sure how that developed, if uh, anyone has any history for that or if it's always been a close relationship, um, haven't been in Pittsburgh long enough to say, but happy to see it happening either way. I mean, I can't really speak for Pittsburgh, but in, in my experience, I think part of it is that it's a, it's a much smaller city and they only have one city forester. And so Lisa has to depend a lot more on the um, volunteer planting to get any planting done and others can correct me if that's inaccurate but my understanding is that is that the city of Pittsburgh itself doesn't do very much street tree planting and that tree Pittsburgh does the majority of it. Kinsey is that true? Uh, yeah I think I would agree with that it's uh, tree Pittsburgh and the western Pennsylvania conservancy that do a lot of the street tree plantings they all work closely with with the city but I, I think that's right there is only one city forester so um, a lot of that work ends up being collaborative by necessity. Yeah, I agree. I'm also going to be in Pittsburgh this weekend with Tree Pittsburgh, if you want me to ask them. 
<laughs> directly. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's essentially what I was was getting at as well, um, which is good and bad, right? So good that they have such a collaborative outlet and they've had it for the past, I think, Tree Pittsburgh has been in existence for 15 or 20 years now, um, but not great in the sense of building infrastructure collaboratively um, and having to rely on the ebbs and flows of the nonprofit world. So I see that sometimes a little bit with Speak for the Trees in Boston too, um, and a few other organizations in Boston where the city hasn't been able to do things for a very long time and they're finally starting and they're finally starting a master plan process as well. Um, but things need to happen. So Speak for the Trees is like, okay, we're gonna make them happen. <laughs> This seems like a very classic urban forestry dilemma. Uh, in my years working, it's, it's, I feel like this is a recurring recurring question of collaboration uh, between different departments, especially when uh, they're entrenched in years of practice and policy and red tape. It's very difficult to uh, get things moving sometimes. Do we have any other questions for Becky or co contrib contributions to uh, this vibrant conversation? Um, I just wanted to also mention, I think it also comes down to personalities a lot. So I know that Lisa and Danielle get along, get along well, so they have a good relationship and it's not, yeah, it's best to have it operationally formalized, but you can't really discount the, the personalities and how um, that can really affect how well collaboration goes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I would be really interested to hear about uh, different collaborations across across the board, because I know that we've been talking a lot about Philly, Boston, and Pittsburgh, um, but I am really curious to hear how that works in other cities smaller and larger than these. Maybe that'll be a discussion topic for another UEC roundtable if we have one coming up. So, um, well, we're getting to the end of time. So I wanna thank everyone for coming. I know that it's tree planting season, so we're all very busy. Um, and I want to uh, announce for next month in May, on May 18th, we will be having Stephen Harris, the Syracuse City Arborist coming to speak to us. Maybe Stephen will be able to speak to some of these points about collaboration as well, uh, hear, hear about it from the municipal side of things. Uh, so tune in next month on the 18th. Uh, we'll be meeting here again, 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. We'll be happy to see all of you. And as always, this uh, recording of this presentation and the questions will be available on our YouTube page and we will send a link out to all of you when that is updated. So have a wonderful rest of your tree planting season and we'll see you all next month.